<laughs> Guys, I just want to say, I, I, I don't... <laughs> No, you're not really counting on me. I'm being totally sarcastic. But this book is insane! This book is actually insane! What the hell? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that video you saw of me looking a little extra crazy, a little extra, is because I spent half my day today reading White Fragility. This cursed book. Uh, guys, I'm not kidding. This is probably the most toxic book I have ever read in my life. And I'm only halfway through it. I'm only halfway done. I still have a whole second half of the book left to go. But I wanted to make this video while this stuff was still fresh in my mind. If you follow me on Twitter and or Parlor, you saw me tweeting an awful lot today about the nonsense that's in this book. And listen, I knew from the very beginning. I knew from the beginning that this book was going to have nonsense in it because for in the introduction right here, we're already seeing we're already seeing nonsense in this introduction when she says, "In my early days of my work when I was then what was termed a diversity trainer, I was taken aback at how angry and defensive so many white people became at the suggestion that they were connected to racism in any way. The very idea that they would be required to attend a workshop on racism outraged them. They entered the room angry and made that feeling clear to us that the day throughout the days they slammed their notebooks on the table, refused to participate in exercises, and argued against any and all points. And the reason I knew that was BS is because I'm a corporate trainer. I do corporate training while in, in in normal times when I'm actually allowed to go places. I did corporate training all the time. I did corporate training several times a month. I have done hundreds of corporate trainings. I have trained thousands of people. I can count on one hand the number of people that have come into one of my trainings and they've been angry and they've been slamming their notebooks on things. And that, that includes, by the way, I've actually worked with diversity trainers, not like crappy diversity trainers like Rob and D'Angelo, but like actually good diversity trainers that have good ideas. I've even worked with them and I haven't seen this nonsense. There's actually only been one person in any training that I have ever done that has refused to do exercises. And guess who it was? It was an old white lady that is one of the biggest SJWs I have ever met in my life. That's the only person that has ever refused to participate in my exercises. And so this is in the very beginning of the book. So I knew right away that this was not gonna be the most fun read I've ever had. I, I, however, I have to be honest, I did not anticipate just how toxic this cursed book is. Listen, in fact, we're gonna throw that book. Throw it across the room. I don't want it anywhere near me. Book is gone. That book is, uh, uh, you know, I'm gonna keep the, the facts don't care about your feelings stuff till the end of the video, but let, let me just say that one of the reasons you're seeing me in a hat right now is I had to have a go, good long meditation session and a really long shower before I did this video because I felt so sick after reading half the book. And I'm gonna explain more about that at the end. We're gonna save that for, for, all, for all the conservatives that don't wanna hear about feelings and squishy things and like whatever. Um, we're gonna save that till the end, okay? But let's just talk about facts. Let's just talk about the nonsense that's in this book. So we're gonna go through several, maybe more than several, maybe several, several of my highlights from the first half of the book. But before we get into that, folks, if you like my content, even if it pisses you off, like I really hope this video does, but if you like my content, you like me exposing this nonsense to the world, please subscribe to my channel, to, uh, turn on those notifications, give it a thumbs up. If you think you're subscribed, just double check that because on Friday, YouTube unceremoniously subscri unsubscribed hundreds of people from my from my channel. So if you were subscribed on Friday, you might not be subscribed anymore. Just go ahead and double check that. All right, let's get in to this nasty, nasty content, shall we? So one of the things I wanna highlight is one of the things that D'Angelo does throughout this book 
is she makes the assertion that many people think this and many people think that. So I literally just started underlining anytime I saw many participants claimed this or many people saw that or things like that. Many, many white participants who lived in so like she makes these broad generalizations about many people or about in some cases entire populations of people and she doesn't have data to back it up. Now, I'm actually a qualitative researcher when I do academic e research. I do qualitative research. What that means is I actually researched the lived experiences. Ooh. But the thing of it is, is when you're doing qualitative research in a, an accurate way and an authentic way, is there is actually a process you have to go through to analyze lived experiences. It's not just willy nilly. Someone had said they had lived experience and you take that for all it's worth. I, so I, you know, there are proper ways to do this. I'm also a fan of using stories and personal anecdotes when you're writing things but not when you're making broad generalizations about entire populations from people of people rather that you don't back up with data it just makes no sense and she does it throughout this book she does not provide data to support her claims there is a little oh I wish I hadn't thrown the book across the room. I showed you that there are footnotes in it, but the footnotes are very, very sparse. She's not citing a lot of research in this book at all. It's mostly anecdotal evidence. Let's keep going. Ah, on this one, we actually have something that I agree with. So very early on in the book, this is still introduction page five, Robin D'Angelo says, I believe that white progressives cause the most daily damage to people of color. I thought that was really interesting. And another interesting thing is this is clearly a book that is written for people who consider themselves politically progressive. That is who the audience of this book is for. I mean, she says it throughout the book. This is for progressives. This is for progressives. This is for progressives. Why would she be writing a book specifically targeted at progressives? I mean, I think that that's a really interesting question to consider. Why Why would that motivation be made so clear throughout the book that this is just for political progressives? Because as if no one else that's not a political progressive, progressive wants to fight racism, right? Is that what she's saying? Or is that, is that simply the audience that could be reeled right in with this type of BS nonsense? Let's keep going. Oh. On this one, sorry, I'm actually pulling up from my tweets that I sent out just to just to make things easy. So on this one, I just want to start with the premise that uh, Robin D'Angelo's theory of white fragility, that all white people are racist and they've always been racist and they'll always be racist and our white fragility is on display anytime that we get upset or offended or angry at the notion that we are racist. Let's just take for a second and say that is an accurate theory. Bear with me. I don't actually mean that but I'm, I'm, I'm making a point. So let's read what she says in this paragraph. In fact, when we try to talk openly about and honestly about race, white fragility quickly emerges as we are so often met with silence, defensiveness, argumentation, certitude, and other forms of pushback. These are not natural responses. That's wrong. That's wrong. What Robin D'Angelo is describing right here, silence, defensiveness, argumentation, certitude, and other forms of pushback, that is the very definition of fight or flight. Fight or flight is our natural response when we perceive a threat. So then to say these are not natural responses that we would do these things when we feel our survival is threatened. And keep in mind too, when, she's, when I'm talking about survival in this case, she's going into organizations and doing this type of training and claiming and I don't necessarily know that I believe the claims, but she is claiming that white people get angry and outraged if they have to do this type of training. And then she's saying this is not a natural response. Well, of course it is. Because what's happening is those white people, those outraged, angry white people, if they really do exist, they're afraid of losing their job if they don't do this type of training. That's how this stuff manifests in organizations. So she's, she's either wrong, she's either lying about what people are doing, or she's flat wrong about people when she says this is not a natural response. It is a natural response. That is what our fight or flight response is. Let's keep going. All right, on this one. Oh, we've got a whole bunch of stuff in this one. Let's, let's read this paragraph. In addition to challenging our sense of ourselves as individuals, tackling group identity or challenges our belief system, 
are also, excuse me, tackling group identity also challenges our belief in objectivity. And now she's going to go through a bunch of assumptions. See if you can identify the assumptions that she's about to go through. If group membership is relevant, then we don't see the world from the universal human perspective, but from the perspective of a particular kind of human. In this way, both ideologies are disrupted. Thus, reflecting on our racial frames is particularly challenging for many white people because we are taught that we have to have a racial viewpoint, that we are taught that to have a racial viewpoint is to be biased. Okay, so let's look at at least three assumptions that she's making in that paragraph. One, that our group membership is the most relevant part of our experience as human beings. The color of your skin is the most relevant part of who you are and what you experience in this lifetime. That's assumption number one. Number two is that everyone who is in the same group as you, everyone who has the same skin color as you, sees the world in the same way and has the exact same experience. And three, that means all white people experience white fragility. It's just the way it is. Those are assumptions. She hasn't proven them. She has not backed them up. Let's keep going. All right, in this one she says, that he could be in an overwhelmingly white room of coworkers and exempt himself from examination of his whiteness because Italians were once discriminated against is an all too common example of individualism. So in this example, Robin D'Angelo has done a training in an organization and an Italian person has come up to her and, and she doesn't like it when, when white people ask her questions. She, she always demeans white people who are daring to ask her questions. In this example, an Italian American has came up, come up to her and he says, listen, Italians were once discriminated against in this country, which is absolutely true. It's true of the Irish as well. And what she says, essentially, and you see this a little later on. In fact, let's just go to the next thing. What she says the, the, was, um, let's see, a more fruitful. So he comes up to her and asks her a question. And she's like, oh, how dare this white man come up and ask me a question? Because she considers him white. She doesn't consider him to be Italian. She considers him white. She says a more fruitful form of engagement because it expands rather than protects his current worldview would have been to consider how Italian Americans were able to become white and how that assimilation has shaped his experiences in the present as a white man. That's incredibly racist. Not only did she say that him focusing on himself as an Italian American was not part of a group that he was in, but it was a form of individualism, which is makes no sense whatsoever. But she's also saying that Italian Americans are basically white. They're, she's wiping their experience and their culture off the table. That's incredibly racist. And it is not the last time we're going to see Robin D'Angelo be racist in the first half of this cursed book. Let's keep going. Okay, so what do I have underlined here? She says, therefore, if I am saying that my readers are racist or even worse, that all white people are racist, I am saying something deeply offensive. I am questioning my readers' very moral character. How can I make this claim when I don't even know my readers? Many of you have friends and loved ones of color, so how can you be racist? And then she goes on to say, if I am not using the definition of racism to mean the standard definition of racism, which is the ones that average people use, if I am not using this definition de definition of racism and I am not saying that you are immoral, what she's saying essentially is that the way that she proves her point that all white people are racist and all white people experience white fragility, the way that Robin D'Angelo is doing that is by changing the definition of racism. So if you have friends and family, as I do, I actually had friends tell me when I was pushing back against them on this stupid book, they said, Carlin, we're not saying that you're racist. And I said, Liz, yes, yes, you are. Because that's what this book says. This book says that all white people are racist. It says that I am racist. It says that you're racist. It says that everyone is racist. And the only thing that we can do is pay Robin D'Angelo money to sit in our discomfort and work on our white fragility. That's exactly what it says. And the reason she can say that is because she changed the definition of racism. Let's keep going. In this one, Let's see. 
in this one, because race is a product of social forces, it has also manifested itself along class lines. Oh my God, this is incredibly racist. Get ready for it. Poor and working class people were not always perceived as fully white. In a society that grants fewer opportunities to those not seen as white, economic and racial forces are inseparable. However, poor and working class whites were eventually granted full entry into whiteness to support to exploit labor. If poor whites were focused on feeling superior to those below them in status, they were less focused on those above. So she's saying what, what, what the poor people, what, what, the, what the labor class, what the blue collar workers should have been focused on is on the oppressors above them, the business owners. That, the woman is literally calling for communism here. That's what she's calling for. She goes on to say, uh, the poor and working class, if united across race, could be a powerful force to overthrow the oppressors. But racial divisions have served to keep them from organizing against their owning class who profits from their labor. Robin D'Angelo in this one is not only saying that poor white people are racist because they're more focused on keeping keeping the black people beneath them down than they are on uh, subverting their oppressors. She's actually calling for a communist revolution in this. That's what this calls for. That's what she's saying. This stuff is nuts. I swear to God. You can't make this stuff up. Can't make it up. Can't. All right, let's keep going. I might, I might lose my voice. I was yelling a lot earlier, but we're going to persevere. We are not giving in to my white fragility in this particular one. Okay, let's see. Many of us can acknowledge that we do feel some unease around certain groups of people, if only a heightened sense of self-consciousness, but this feeling doesn't come naturally. Our unease comes from living separately from a group of people while simultaneously absorbing incomplete or erroneous information about them. When the prejudices cause, when the prejudice causes me to act differently, I am less relaxed around you or I avoid interacting with you. I am now discriminating. Prejudice often manifests itself in action because the way I see the world drives my actions. Now, I wanted to throw Robin D'Angelo a bone with this one because she's right. That last sentence is right. The way you see the world, the inner dialogue you have in your head will dictate your actions in, cer in all circumstances. It doesn't matter. Whatever inner dialogue you have in your head about whatever is going on around you, your actions will follow. But the rest of that paragraph is basically her admitting her own racism. And we're going to keep seeing that. She does it again and again and again and again and again and again. Let's keep going. This one says, um, this is essentially if, if men were required to vote in or if this is about men giving women the right to vote, essentially. And she says, but men as a group could and did deny women their civil rights. Of course, we got to get gender stuff thrown in here. I'm not exactly sure why, but that was also thrown in here. And it goes on to say men could only do so because they controlled all the institutions. So basically the argument she's making is that women only have rights because men who controlled all the institutions granted them the rights from on high. And it's exactly the same thing with white fragility. It's exactly the same thing with the evil white people who control all the institutions and are the grantor of rights to black people. But the question I have is this. The men, the men who gave women the right to vote, they had to vote to give women the right to vote, didn't they? Like, if, if these men, are these men, are, are men still misogynists if they grant women the right to vote? I don't know. Just a, just a little side note there. Let's keep going. All right. If we're on track, all the things I've covered so far, I think this is just an interesting note. Everything that I've covered so far up to this video, and I didn't even do all the tweets I had pulled up. That only gets you to page 20 of the book. This is a 150 page book. That gets you to page 20. Well, we've already covered. Let's keep going. All right. Oh, in this one, I just thought this was interesting. So you're going to see, um, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but she's talking about the metaphor of a bird cage to describe the interlocking forces of oppression. And when you're really close to a bird cage, you can see through without seeing the wires. And it's very different than if you're, if you're far away from the bird cage. Some sort of stupid bird cage analogy. Here's the point I wanted to make. 
She does this all the time in the book. Instead of offering data, instead of providing data to prove her points, to show empirical evidence, what she does is she offers an analogy. And by the time she's done with the analogy, what she wants is that you're going to forget that she never gave you data to prove the point that she wanted to make. Let's keep going. Keep going. We got a lot more to get through. Okay. Harris's analysis is useful because it shows how identity and perception of identity can grant or deny resources. These resources include self-worth, visibility, positive expectations, psychological freedom from the tether of race, freedom of movement, the sense of belonging, and a sense of entitlement to all the above. What is she saying here? She's saying that you have to be white in order to experience self-worth and have positive expectations. That's what this is saying, that you have to be white to have all those things. If you're not white, you just can't expect to have self-worth. I mean, are you kidding me? This is one of the most racist things I've ever read. Let's keep going. Oh, here she's making a point about Jackie Robinson. And she says, Jackie Robinson, the first black man whites allowed to play Major League Baseball. And I actually thought that was a really good point. I did. I have to throw her another bone on this one. I thought that was a good point. But she spent the rest of the damn page completely diminishing Jackie Robinson's accomplishments. I couldn't help but think that, like, he, like, you know, regardless of, of whether or not he was the very best at what he did or if he was just the guy that the Whites chose to play baseball, he still accomplished a major feat. And he inspired a lot of people and he opened the door to people of color playing in the major leagues, however that might have happened. And I agree that it probably should have happened sooner and there were probably many deserving people who never got the shot. We can agree on that. But why does she have to diminish his accomplishments in the process of making this point? Let's keep going. Although rare individual people of color may be inside the circles of power, she's making a point about how white people control all the institutions. Although rare individual people of color may be inside the circles of power, Colin Powell, Clarence Thomas, Marco Rubio, Barack Obama. They support the status quo and do not challenge racism in any way significant enough to be threatening. So I'm sure Barack Obama would really like to hear that, that he upheld a racist system. Let's keep going. Whites also produce and reinforce the dominant narratives of society, such as individualism and meritocracy, and use those narratives to explain the positions of other racial groups. So what she's saying here is the idea that you can achieve things through hard work and merit. That's for white people. That's for white people. That's so racist. That's so racist. What is that? The bigotry of low expectations made visible in a book saying it's combating racism. Let's keep going. Got a lot more. Let's keep going. We're doing rapid fire. Rapid fire white fragility. The failure to acknowledge white supremacy protects it, protects it from examination and holds it in place. I'm going to say that again because I thought this was really interesting. The failure to acknowledge white supremacy protects it from examination and holds it in place. The reason I thought that was interesting is Robin D'Angelo's whole argument with white fragility is that you can't question it. In fact, she gets very offended when she's questioned by white people about white fragility. And so isn't it, isn't this saying exactly the same thing? Isn't this saying that every white, this isn't the same thing as saying it, what, like every white person is racist and if they question their own racism, that that's just more proof that they're racist. It's exactly the same thing as what she's saying the power structures do here. Let's keep going. Given that the majority of white people live in racial isolation from people of color, and black people in particular, and very few have authentic cross-racial relationships, white people are deeply influenced by racial messages in film. What she's saying here is that white people don't have black friends in real life and their only perception of black people is in the movies. I shit you not, you can't make this stuff up. Let's keep going. At the most general level, the racial frame views whites as superior in culture and achievement and views people of color as generally of less social, social, economic, and political consequence. People of color are seen as inferior to whites in the making and keeping of the nation. Doesn't that sound like it was written by an incredibly racist person? She, she offers nothing to back this up. 
Know that there's no footnote there. There's no footnote. She offers nothing to back this up. This is her own experience. No one forced Robin D'Angelo to sit down and write a racist book. That is a completely racist statement written by a very racist woman. Let's keep going. Countless studies show empirically that people of color are discriminated against in the workplace. In order to prove that, she cites one study, one study about people with black sounding names not getting called back for job interviews as much as people with white sounding names. Now, that's a legit thing. That's something that we should work on, but it is not countless studies that improve empirically that people of color are discriminated against in the workplace. It's just not. Let's keep going. Consider a conversation I had with a white friend. She was telling me about how a white couple she knew had just moved to New Orleans and bought a house for a mere $25,000. Of course, she added immediately, they also had to buy a gun, and Joan is afraid to leave the house. I immediately knew they had bought a house in a black neighborhood. Why is Robin D'Angelo hanging out with racist friends when she is the premier anti-racist trainer right now in the country? Because that sounds incredibly racist to me. Does that sound racist to you? Because it sounds incredibly racist to me. Why are you hanging out with racist friends, Robin? Why? Why haven't you had them sit in their discomfort and go to one of your workshops? Why? Let's keep going. Um, in this one, every aspect of being white discussed in this chapter is shared by virtually all white people in the Western context generally and the U.S. context specifically. She provided no evidence in this chapter. Zero evidence to say that everything she talked about in this chapter was true of all white people in the Western world. Let's move on. Indeed, the forces of racism were shaping me before I even took my first breath. Now, this point, this is the point where I bust out laughing hysterically. Literally, I couldn't help myself. This is when I made that video you saw at the beginning of the video. Like, I just could not help myself. The forces of racism were shaping me while I was still in the wound. Are you kidding me? Let's go on. This is why I'm losing my mind, people. This is why I'm crazy. This is, oh, oh, this is one of my favorite examples of racism in the entire book. For example, I was invited to the retirement party of a white friend. The party was a potluck picnic held in a public park. As I walked down the slopes toward the picnic shelters, I noticed two parties going on side by side. One gathering was primarily composed of white people and the other appeared to be all black people. I experienced a sense of disequilibrium as I approached and I had to choose which party was my friends. I felt a mild sense of anxiety as I considered that I might have to enter the all black group, then mild relief when I realized that my friend was in the other group. That's racist. That is racist. That's a completely racist statement. If you are approaching a group of, of two parties and one is black and one is white and you are afraid of going to the black potluck, that is racist. You are a racist. You might actually need this book. You might connect very well with Robin D'Angelo because that is a completely racist statement. Let's Let's keep going. I have made the assumption myself that when I have been unable to hide my surprise that the black man is the school principal, or when I ask a Latinx woman kneeling in her garden if this is her house, that's racist, Robin D'Angelo. She does this over and over again. There are so many stories in this book that are just completely unnecessary to the book that she adds in there to confess her sin of racism. Let's keep going. Uh, what am I saying? What is, what am, oh, okay. I know what I was saying here. Okay. What she's saying is basically that, that people of color don't work in the same jobs as white people. That's what she's saying. And although I may encounter a token person of color during the hiring process, if I am not specifically applying to an organization founded by people of color, the majority of those I interact with will share my race. Once hired, I won't have to deal with my coworkers' resentment that I only got the job because I am white. I am assumed to be the most qualified. So what Robin D'Angelo is saying here is that if she, the white lady, gets hired, it's going to be because of her merit. But if a person of color gets hired to work in the same organization, it's going to be because they were a 
token person of color. She's literally tokenizing people. That's racist. Let's keep going. I might worry about my class status in some settings, for example, when attending a high society event, such as a museum opening or an art auction. And then this one I commented like, this book may as well be called Confessions of Bougie White Women Who Are Working Through Their Own Guilt Regarding Their Own Obvious Privilege and Racism and Trying to Bring Everything Else Down With Her. That's what this is. That, I mean, that's not quite racist, but that's basically saying, I am an uppity white woman that goes to high class events and I, I worry about my own racism when I go to these events. Let's keep going. She might be accused of being politically correct or be perceived as angry, humorless, combative, and not suited to go far in the organization. What she's talking about here is a, a white person who calls out people on their racism. So what Robin D'Angelo asserts is that it is the responsibility of white people. If someone says something racist around you, it is the responsibility of white people to call them out and say, stop being racist. Well, then she says, well, white people, they might not want to do this because someone might say they're politically correct and don't have a sense of humor if they do. And this is a form of social coercion. How ironic is it that this woman who throws the term racist around like willy nilly, like it means nothing, is somehow threatened by the fact that someone might call you politically correct as a form of social coercion? Let's keep going. The most profound message of racial segregation may be the absence of people of color from our lives is no real loss. The, the thought I had with this one is like, then why are people on the left constantly trying to segregate races? Why? I mean, we saw this in the, in the Chaz or the Chop or whatever in Seattle. They had black only areas. Like why, why are people on the left trying to promote racial segregation if they think that people of color matter in their lives. Like, I love having a variety of friends. I love having a variety of people around me from all different backgrounds and experiences and races and genders and identities and all those things. Like, everyone is welcome in my life. I'm not gonna create little freaking groups where I hang out with, you know, the white friends in this place and the black friends. I mean, that's stupid, right? That's stupid. But what she's saying here is that, you know, racial segregation would lead to profound loss of experience in our lives. And she's right. She's right. So then why do people on the left constantly try to segregate races? Let's keep going. Oh, this is this right here. This is like the most racist statement that I've gotten to so far in the book. Okay, let's let's see if you can count the instances of racism in this statement. My psychosocial development was inculcated in a white supremacist culture in which I am in the superior group. She just called herself superior. She just said she's in the superior group. That's point one. Telling me not to, telling me to treat everyone the same is not enough to override this socialization. So she can't treat people the same, nor is it humanly possible. I was raised in a society that taught me there was no loss in the absence of people of color, that their experience was that their, excuse me, that their absence was a good and desirable thing to be sought and maintained while simultaneously denying the fact she, she grew up in a segregated environment. That's point number three. This attitude shaped every aspect of my self-identity, my interests, investments, what I care about, what I don't, blah, 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 blah. These attitudes shaped every part of her identity. So what she's saying here in this one paragraph Robin D'Angelo was taught that she was part of a superior group. She was taught that it is not possible to treat everyone the same. She was taught that racial segregation is good. And these attitudes informed every part of her identity. Robin D'Angelo is racist. She's racist. That's what this says. Let's keep going. We got a couple more. Many whites have no cross-racial friendships at all. But even those that have cross-racial friendships use that as evidence of their lack of racism. Okay, so what she's saying here, let me paraphrase this. Most white people don't have black friends, but even if they do have black friends, they're still racist. Because white people are always racist, no matter what. No matter what. And final, that's it. That's it. That, that's, that's, that's actually the last one. That's it. That's all I could get through because I lost my mind and I went crazy. And I just couldn't read anymore. I really couldn't. I 
guys, and this is, I'm about to get into the touchy-feely aspect of this, conservatives, um, listen, I'm a deeply empathic person. I'm a very empathic person. What that means is I can pick up on emotions of things very easily and and I can I can just pick up on these things and I, I actually feel it in my body. Now, that could be because I meditate a whole lot. That be, could be because I practice mindfulness every single day. That could be because I've done an awful lot of plant medicine like ayahuasca and that sort of thing and it's opened me up to that experience. It could be any number of these things. But reality is for me, like I physically feel when I'm around negative toxic bullshit. I really do. I got so physically sick earlier. I got physically, you're still, I mean, my throat is still messed up, man. My whole body was like, it was like shutting down. I swear. I had to go meditate for an hour. I had to take a good long shower. Like I, and I still feel sick. I still feel sick from reading this book. I am actually convinced that this book is toxic. I, I really am. This ideology is toxic. This book is toxic. I feel it in every fiber of my being. Listen, when I wrote my Trump rally article that went viral, some of you know this story, some of you don't. When I wrote my Trump rally article, um, I, I've always said that that article didn't come from me. That ar article came from God because it was so easy to write. It, it, it was like it came through me and I just happened to be the vessel. I don't take any credit for that article at all. And I think one of the reasons it went viral and it really resonated was because it didn't come from me, it came from God. It came, it came from an inspirational source and it was a message that a lot of people needed to hear. That's why I think it resonated. This book is exactly the opposite. If my article came from God and made people happy and made people feel good, this book is going to make people sick. This book comes from a very dark place and I don't, I don't use that lightly, guys. You know, I don't actually talk about this stuff that often to say that this is actually an evil book. But how I felt earlier today, honestly, I don't even know if I'm going to finish the book. I really, really don't. I don't know if I'm going to finish it because I just felt really, really sick. And I just hope that I'm going to go downstairs. I'm going to re relax. I might have a glass of wine. I might do a little bit of that. And, um, and I, hopefully I feel better tomorrow. But dude, like I can't even, can't even. All right, that's all I've got for this one. I'm obviously about to lose my voice. I will be back at you guys with another video very, very soon.